Hey everyone! Today we dive into the fascinating origins of the Huns, a topic that's kept historians debating for centuries. The Huns' story is wrapped in mystery, especially when it comes to figuring out where they came from and how they connect to other groups like the Kishanites, Alcon Huns, Kitarites, Hephthalites, and Huna. Scholars have been puzzling over these connections for ages, and honestly there's still no clear answer. Here's the thing. Ancient Greek and Roman sources don't really tell us much about where the European Huns originated. They just seem to pop up suddenly around 370 CE. But if you dig into Chinese records, you'll find references to groups that might be linked to the Huns, though the accounts don't always agree. In 1757, Joseph de Guinness suggested that the Huns might be the same as the Sangnu, a powerful nomadic group mentioned in Chinese history. This idea was later championed by Edward Gibbon, who made it famous in his epic, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Since then scholars have been debating this theory, looking at historical, linguistic, and archaeological evidence. Some agree there's a link, others reject it outright, and many fall somewhere in between. One of the biggest clues connecting the Huns and saying new is their names. They sound pretty similar across different languages, whether it's Chinese, Greek, Latin, or Sanskrit. Some historians also point to the use of similar cauldrons by both groups as another clue. Plus, recent genetic studies hint at some shared ancestry between Hun-era individuals and the Shang-Nu. But it's not all smooth sailing for this theory. There are plenty of differences in their archaeological remains, customs, and even a 200-year gap between when the Shang-Nu disappeared and when the Huns showed up in Europe. That's a big reason why many experts still aren't convinced. So how did this idea evolve? De Guin's theory caught on in the 18th and 19th centuries, especially with historians fascinated by the nomadic lifestyles of these groups. But then things got tricky. Scholars started looking at their languages, and the theories started to fall apart. Some believed the Huns spoke a Finno-Ugric language, while others thought they were Turkic, Mongolic, or even Slavic speakers. These disagreements only deepened the mystery. Fast forward to the 20th century, and the debate got a major shakeup. German Sinologist Friedrich Hirth thought he found solid proof in Chinese annals linking the Xiongnu to the Huns. His work convinced a lot of people, until Otto J. Menchen Helfen came along in the 1940s and challenged everything. He argued that the evidence didn't hold up and that the two groups were probably unrelated. His skepticism has influenced many scholars since then. Even today the debate rages on. Some historians argue that the Huns deliberately used the name Hun to connect themselves to the fearsome reputation of the Kangnu. Others think the name might have been an exonym, a label used by outsiders to describe them, or even just a coincidence. And then there's the question of pronunciation. How the name Xiongnu was originally spoken in Old Chinese is still up for debate, adding another layer of complexity. And the origins of the European Huns have long puzzled historians. Classical sources, like those from Ammianus Marcellinus, offer only vague clues, suggesting their sudden appearance in Europe around 370 CE. Some writers of the time linked the Huns to earlier steppe cultures, like the Royal Scythians or even the Parthians, while others spun myths that cast them as shadowy figures, born of Gothic witches and unclean spirits. These dramatic tales, while colorful, offer little concrete evidence. The Huns' arrival is often tied to stories of accidental encounters, like pursuing a stag or a stray cow across the Kerch Strait, only to stumble upon the fertile lands of the Goths and subsequently attack them. It's almost as if their entrance was more legend than reality, at least in the eyes of those recording it. Scholars like Otto Mankin Helfen and Dennis Sinor remind us that much of what we know or think we know about their origins remains speculative, built more on classical writers' assumptions than hard facts. Some modern researchers have tried to trace the Huns further back, looking for earlier mentions that might connect them to other peoples. 
Yoon Jin Kim, for instance, suggests that a group Ptolemy called the Konoi in the 2nd century CE could be an earlier reference to the Huns. However, others like historian Thompson remain skeptical, arguing that while names might sound similar, it doesn't necessarily mean we're talking about the same people. When it comes to the so-called Iranian Huns, the mystery deepens. Their history is recorded in an even more fragmented way, with sources often conflating them with other groups, like the Chianites or Hephthalites. Coins, rather than written texts, have become the most reliable evidence for piecing together their story. Chinese records mention waves of invaders, sometimes fleeing other groups like the Xiongnu or the Ruran, who followed similar paths into Central Asia and Iran. For example, the Chianites are said to have attacked Bactria around 350 CE, while the Hephthalites' origins remain murky, with suggestions ranging from the Tarim Basin to connections with the Kangju. Debates over these groups often hinge on how interconnected their movements were. Some argue for a single wave of migration that ties the Iranian Huns to the European Huns, while others see them as distinct entities, linked only by geography and coincidence. Scholars like Etienne de Lavoisier even point to Buddhist texts and Sogdian letters from as early as the 3rd century CE that use names resembling Hun or Xiongnu, suggesting a continuity of identity across regions and centuries. Archaeology adds another layer of complexity but doesn't always provide clear answers. There's little to directly connect the material culture of the Xiongnu, who dominated parts of Mongolia and China, with the Huns who later appeared in Europe. Differences in burial practices and settlement patterns make it hard to draw a straight line between them. Some artifacts, like bronze cauldrons and the components of the Hunnic composite bow, hint at possible links. Yet, these items could just as easily reflect trade and cultural exchange along the Silk Road rather than direct migration. Artificial cranial deformation, where skulls were deliberately elongated, has also been cited as a potential cultural marker. It's found in both European Hunnic burials and among the Alcon Huns depicted on their coins. But this practice, widespread across Eurasia, doesn't seem exclusive to any one group and might have been adopted independently in different regions. Ultimately, while connections between the Huns, Shengnu, and other steppe peoples are fascinating, they remain speculative. Archaeological findings and historical texts offer tantalizing clues, but the story is far from complete. Even the most compelling theories often lead to more questions than answers leaving the Huns shrouded in the very mystery that defines them. And Roman sources painted a vivid image of the Huns, describing features that lean toward an East Asian or Mongoloid appearance, which aligns with Chinese accounts of the Shengnu. On the other hand, the Hephthalites, also called the White Huns, stirred debates about their looks. Procopius described them as having white bodies, which some scholars argue might have been a misunderstanding of their name rather than an actual reference to skin tone. Their envoy's portrait in Chinese records reveals Mongolian-like features, but curly hair was also noted, something not typical of East Asians. Clearly, their physical traits remain a topic of speculation. Ethnographic descriptions make things even murkier. Some scholars, like Peter Heather, have questioned whether the Huns and Xiongnu were even related. For instance, the Xiongnu were noted for wearing their hair in cues, a detail absent in descriptions of the Huns. And Procopius's claim that the Hephthalites were distinct from other Hunnic groups adds another layer of complexity. Practices like polyandry, linked to the Hephthalites, were rare in most of the Eurasian steppe, suggesting influences from regions like the Tibetan Plateau, However, others argue these customs were simply adopted from local cultures. Governance structures further highlight differences and similarities. The Xiangnu were a unified state under a single ruler called the Chanyu, while the Huns appeared in Europe as a fragmented confederation. That said, some historians, like Yun Jin Kim, believe the Huns were more unified than earlier sources suggest especially given their ability to launch simultaneous invasions of powerful empires like the Sasanians and the Romans.
Agreements between the Huns and Romans bore some resemblance to the treaties the Xiangnu made with the Chinese, but such arrangements weren't unique to them. Other steppe peoples, like the Goths, struck similar deals. As for religion, the picture is incredibly hazy. Some evidence hints at practices like oracle bone divination, which could signal a Chinese influence. Shared rituals, such as the use of cauldrons, suggest a cultural connection between the Xiongnu and the Huns, though scholars like Ursula Broster challenge this idea. Worship of swords or war gods seems to have been common across steppe nomads, with some even linking the Huns' practices to the Kangnu's Kenglu cult. But not everyone agrees. Some argue that the supposed sword worship among the Huns might be more legend than fact. Language presents a particularly tangled web. We don't know for certain what language the Huns spoke, though many of their names seem Turkic. The Xiongnu, too, were multilingual, governing an empire that spanned vast cultural and linguistic divides. Some scholars suggest the Xiongnu elite spoke Yeniseian, later transitioning to Turkic as they migrated westward. The Hephalites may have spoken an Iranian language initially, but could have switched to local tongues as they ruled over sedentary populations. This fluidity of language wasn't unusual for nomadic groups, who often adopted the speech of those they conquered or allied with. Genetic studies provide fascinating, albeit incomplete, insights. Populations tied to the Huns show a mix of East Asian and West Eurasian ancestry. In the Pannonian Basin, Hunic era genomes reveal ties to Northeast Asian groups like the Xiongnu and Shanbi, alongside connections to European groups. This genetic diversity reflects the Huns' history of migration and intermingling. Recent studies even show genetic traces linking the Huns to Scytho Sarmatian and Germanic populations, further complicating attempts to pin down a singular origin. While some genetic evidence strengthens the case for connections between the Huns and Xiongnu, it's clear their story is one of convergence, a blend of East and West, shaped by migration, conquest, and assimilation.